Every second in the world, throughout the world, the men of the world make 200,000 billion sperm. And that's a lot of sperm. Think about it. That's a lot of sperm. Every second, the women of the world make 400 eggs. And every second, four children are born. So that's a huge difference in the, in the strategy, reproductive strategy of males and females. Thousands of millions of cells from males, tens of cells from females. And that's what differentiates males from females, Adam from Eve. Why should that be? Well, I think it goes back to the very beginning of, what it, of maleness. Uh, most biologists believe that in the 3,000 million years or so which had life on Earth, the first 1,000 million years was a genuine Garden of Eden. There was no Adam there. There was only Eve. It was entirely female. And by female, of course, I mean clonal. Cells that were single-cell lines that divided and copied themselves. And life was very happy for a 1,000 million years. Then there was a mutation. What the mutation did, the genetic change did, was to persuade the members of one clone to fuse to another one and persuade the second one to divide. And in that instant, males were born. Males have been parasites on females since they began. Now, it's a great idea for the mutation because it doubles its rate of spread. It's not nearly as good an idea for the clone, the females, who receive it because they have to do the extra work of copying that new mutated gene. So at once, there is a conflict, a disagreement, a war between the sexes. The interest of the males was to make as many copies of that um, small clone cell as possible and to fuse with as many large female cells as possible. So once the pressure was on to make lots of small mobile sex cells. Females can't do that because when they're dividing, they have to provide enough energy and food for the, um, uh, the cell in the next division and for the embryo in higher creatures so they can't reduce their size. So there's a constant battle between males and females. We know now, indeed, that the battle between sperm and egg for fertilization is much fiercer than the battle between the male and the female sea elephant for copulation. Only one sperm in many, many millions actually gets into the egg, and that's because the egg has hundreds of barriers, about which we know a lot of the molecular biology now, that keeps sperm out. So we have this battle, males as parasites, males as tapeworms, since the day they began. But interestingly enough, the battle also gives us the opportunity to search out the differential history of, men, of males and females in general, and men and women in particular. Um, women have a history which is written um, not in their Y chromosomes, because they don't have a Y chromosome, but in this, cre in this thing here, which I'm sure you'll all recognize. It's a mitochondrion, the powerhouse of the cell, as everybody knows. It's where most of the cell metabolism is actually done. Now, mitochondria, interestingly enough, themselves started as parasites. Um, long before males did, they were bacteria that got into early cells and have stuck there. Now, mitochondria in most, but not all creatures, certainly in humans, mitochondria are only passed down the female line. They're in the egg, which is full of mitochondria and other things, so they're passed down only through females. Males get them. The, the men in this audience have got mitochondria, which they've got from their mother, but the men in this audience will not pass them on because they're excluded from the sperm at the moment of fertilization. Mitochondria have genes. They have a special and rather strange um, uh, set of genes, um, which we know a lot about, and that just like Y chromosomes, they're very variable. So that, in fact, we have two asexual systems going on. We have an asexual system of inheritance through men, father to son to grandson, the Y chromosome, and an asexual system of inheritance through women, the mitochondria. And we can use that, as we'll see, to trace the history of Adam and Eve. And it's a slightly odd one. The beginning of asexual genetics was due to this chap here, who's Francis Galton. And Francis Galton was a British biologist um, who was, the, who was Charles Darwin's cousin. He founded the lab in which I now work, which is called the Galton Laboratory um, in London. And he wrote a book called, in it, called Hereditary Genius, which was about human genetics in a very strange way. It's, uh, it's not at all a good book, but it was the first attempt to generate human pedigrees. And he's seen as the founder of human genetics. He's also seen as the founder of eugenics, which led to the terrible excesses of the Nazi era and indeed of the castration of men in the United States. But I'm not going to talk about that particularly. Galton was a great genius. 
But he was a flawed genius. He had many wonderful ideas, very few of which he followed through. He did many strange things. He was the first person, for example, to publish a weather map, a weather forecast map in a newspaper, in the Times newspaper in London. He was the, um, for, he wrote a paper called um, On the Relative Sensitivity of Men and Women in the Nape of the Neck. And he went around and he tickled lots of men and women at the nape of the neck and found that women giggled sooner than men did. Um, he was the only person to make a beauty map of the British Isles. And he did that with a little counting device, which you can hold in the palm of your hand. And he walked through the streets of British cities, um, scoring the local females on a five-point scale from attractive to repulsive. Um, the low point was in Aberdeen in Scotland, where it still is. Um, and the high point, not surprisingly, was in South Kensington, where Harrods, the Harrods store is. And if you go to Harrods, you'll see that's still the case. He never came to Eastern Europe. I'm sure he would have been very busy had he done so. Um, I tried to persuade my own students to do this, to say, all right, go out and sc you men score the women and you women score the men. But they won't. They're too politically correct. Um, my, my prediction actually is, is that women should be more consistent in their scoring of men than, women, than males are. So if you want a PhD to do, there's, I'll give it to you for, for nothing. You could try it and see. Um, but from our point of view, what Galton was, in, was in, interesting about is that he discovered what happens when you have asexual systems of reproduction. Galton was a rich man, as was Darwin. And he used, he used to go for his vacations, his summer vacations, on walking holidays in Switzerland in particularly to the Italian part of Switzerland, which in those days, and we're talking 1880 or so, was remote and poor and almost nobody ever visited it. And he was wandering through the mountains and he noticed something very strange, which immediately interested him, in, interested him because of his interest in human inheritance and human quality. He'd go to a village, a small village up in the mountains, and notice that everybody had the same surname, the same second name. And as a very pathetic joke, Perhaps you could go to a village and everybody in that village would be called Mr. or Mrs. Pasta. Went over the mountain to 10, 15 kilometers to another village, which looked very much the same, and discovered there that everybody had the same surname, the same second name, the same family name, but it was a different one. It might be Mr. and Mrs. Cannelloni, shall we say. And then the third village, it'd be Mr. and Mrs. some other kind of, Mr. and Mrs. Spaghetti. And immediately he thought to himself, well, this is very interesting. This must prove that over the 500,000 years that these villages have been here, it's because surnames are inherited asexually, down males. Men have sons and daughters, but their daughters get married and change their names, or at least they did in the old systems. Um, and so it's an asexual inheritance. And he pointed out, he actually went into the records of these villages, and he found that when a village was, was started, let's say 500 years ago, there were, there were ten families, pasta, spaghetti, cannelloni, in the village. And, but every generation, as soon as one male had no sons, his name disappeared. Perhaps he had only daughters. Perhaps he had no children at all. Perhaps he was killed in an accident. If, but if he had no sons, the name disappeared. Perhaps in generation two, the name spaghetti disappeared from the first village. The name had gone forever, so the others became more common. And inevitably, one of them then takes over. And in time, everybody gets the same surname. And everybody in that village, in fact, descends from a man called Pastor who lived perhaps 500 years ago. He was the Adam of all everybody in that village. Not only, in fact, did they inherit his um, surname, but they in inherit also his Y chromosome. A friend of mine did a piece of research not long ago. He has a rather unusual English surname, which is Sykes. Um, it's not uncommon, but it's, it's, it's fairly rare. And he had a good idea. He wrote to 500 people called Sykes and said, will you spit into this tube and send me your DNA? And he did that. And in fact, he found that something like 90% of them had the same Y chromosome. They didn't know this. They were scattered all over England. Um, but they did have the same Y chromosome. They all descended from the same man. The other 10%, I'm not going to go into where they came from, um, but uh, uh, there, is a, there, is, there are certain mistakes coming to every family, there's no question. So that's what Adam meant. Way back in 1500, when these Italian villages were founded, there may have been 10 men there, but only one of them was going to persist, his genes were going to persist. He was the Adam, he didn't know, the others didn't know, there were plenty of other males, but he certainly, he certainly existed. And we could, in principle, do exactly the same thing with Eve.
We could do that with mitochondria, and that's actually been done uh, in Canada with mitochondria, and the story's about the same. So let's now turn to this question of who Adam and Eve were, and did they meet? Well, the expulsion from Eden happened, of course, when Eve um, disobeyed instructions and ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Had, she had gained scientia, wisdom, um, which was a big mistake, and they were chucked out immediately. Now, it's rather interesting, the image of what Eden actually was. Eden was clearly a very nice place. Um, you sat around, naked, in warm weather, with plenty of fruit trees ready to be picked, plenty of animals ready to be strangled and eaten. You didn't really have to do much work. Um, there are plenty of pictures of Adam playing a harp. Uh, so Eden was a lovely place to be, a bit like Club Med, in fact, in many ways. Right? Um, as soon as they were thrown out of Eden, life got much, much worse. In fact, God says to uh, Adam and Eve, uh, by the sweat of thy brow thou shalt labor. Now you have to work. And indeed, outside Eden, they began to work. They had to dig um, Cain, who was, uh, who was, uh, who was Eve's son, they, and uh, Cain was the first farmer. His brother Abel was still a hunter-gatherer, but Cain was the first farmer. He had to dig. He invented the idea of private property. In fact, many people say, and I think there's some truth in it, that the myth or the legend of Eve, of a Garden of Eden, may have some elements of accuracy because it marks the end of life as a hunter-gatherer 10,000 years ago or so, when life was rather easy, and the beginning of that really miserable period of human existence, which is only coming to an end now, when we were peasants, when we were farmers. And uh, that marked a dramatic change in the relative position of men and women. Farming began in the Middle East about 8,000 years ago, uh, roughly the same time in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in China. 5,000 years ago, it was all over Europe. By 4,000 years ago, it had gained two separate centers in the Americas. Obviously, you knew nothing about this. And it spread through much of Africa, not particularly through West and South Africa. Now, of course, it's absolutely everywhere. There are no hunter-gatherers, or almost no hunter-gatherers left. There are very few in Botswana, a very few um, possibly in the jungles of South America, but really scarcely any at all. So we don't know very much about the way in which they live. However, it's clear that one way in which they do live is that they have a much easier life than women do, uh, than, than, than farmers do, than women do. Than far women have a much easier life than women who are in farming communities do. In fact, the hunter-gatherers of the Kalkahari Desert in Botswana who were still there when I was there in the 70s, have now more or less disappeared. Um, in order to get enough food to feed their families, they had to work about 12 hours a week. The farmers had to work about 60 hours a week. So farming is really hard work. Karl Marx, that important figure in Polish history, Karl Marx saw, I think it was Engels rather than Marx, Marx agreed with him, Engels saw the origin of, of farming as what he called the world historical defeat of the female sex. And if you look at the social relations of males, men and women in hunter-gatherers, they're much, much more equal and, uh, uh, and fair than they are in farming societies. In fact, the origin of farming marked the beginning of, the de of as Marx, as Engels put it, of, of females' defeat. And the reason is quite simple, which is that, it is that in a peasant society, you've, get, you've, owned, you've invented property. The property, the farm, passes from father to son, uh, no woman can make an existence of her own. She has nothing with which to feed herself. She can only live as being almost the property of her husband or her father and working on the farm. And so women began to lose a lot of their power. And at the origin of farming, you can actually see a great decrease, first of all, in the, rel in the health of the human race as a whole. One of the things which has been very striking in my life has the way in which the average height of young people has gone up. My height... Um, I'm proud to say, used to be in West Britain, in Wales, where I came from, it used to be average, is about 1.7 metres. The mean height in, among uh, young British people now is 1.85 metres. And that's a huge difference in only 20 or 30 years. Uh, for some reason, people are much healthier, much taller now than they were even 50 years ago. If we go to the beginning of farming, we find exactly the opposite. 
within that 200 years at the beginning of har farming, the average height of people had gone down by something like, um, by something like 10 centimeters. And their health had got much, much worse. There were a lot more people around, but they were much less well off because they were only eating grains. They weren't eating well at all. And interestingly enough, the difference in height and health um, was, much, was, was, was much worse in women than in men. Women suffered much more from deficiency diseases. They were shorter. They were stooped. They had to spend all their time grinding grain and that kind of stuff. So there's some truth in the Marx-Engels view. We can actually see the effect of farming in the genes. Uh, my own group and other people have been mapping out the genes of Europe, the Y chromosome variants and the mitochondrial variants. And I suppose our vision of ourselves as men in history is that over history, we males over the last thousand years or so have been out doing what we're supposed to do, raping and pillaging and spread and conquering all the females and spreading our genes around everywhere, whereas the females have stayed at home welcoming our attentions. That's what I think men like to believe. In fact, exactly the opposite is true. If you make a map of Y chromosomes and mitochondria in Europe, and I think as a, a couple of the points do come from Poland, in fact, then exactly the opposite is true. What actually happens is that Europe's women are actually very boring. They're very homogeneous. They don't vary much from place to place. Europe's men, their Y chromosomes at least, are much more localized. There are big shifts over 30 or 40 kilometers. For example, at the boundary of Wales and England, there's a complete shift um, in the pattern of Y chromosomes. And there are some in Central Europe as well. But why should that be? It's this matter of owning property. Because what happens is, if you look at the records, is that in European farming societies, um, fathers passed on their farm to their son, and their son got in a wife from some distance away. So that over, year, over the years, the genes actually move further through the, through the um, females than through the males. So I think there is some truth in this notion of an interaction between the origin of property and a change in the fate of men and women. Well, once you've got property, Marx brings this up rather clearly, quite quickly you get, of course, inequality. And after the, it didn't take long, just about a thousand years after the origin of farming, for the first cities and the first empires to appear, and the first fortifications and the first sites of massacres to be found. So they started. And pretty soon you began to get conquering uh, groups of people going around the world being a damn nuisance. Here's a, a story which I'm not sure I completely believe, but that's, I'll give it to you anyway. Here's this rather baffling looking um, diagram here. It's what we call a phylogeny, a family tree of Y chromosomes. It, what you can do is you can take the DNA sequence of a Y chromosome and you can arrange it into a pattern of interrelatedness. I can't think of any um, uh, Polish exa examples in terms of, of surnames, but the English surname Smith, which is common, is obviously related to the surname Smythe, the surname Smithers, the surname Smithson, and you can use this with DNA. You can make a kind of family tree. It's often quite complicated, but you could, it often makes kind of a web, and you can make a tree of these things that are called haplotypes, and you can, you can make them pretty colors as well, for as we've done here for reasons which aren't completely clear. Um, these are actually a tree of a lot of haplotypes from the Far East. And what's interesting, there's quite a lot of variation there, but there's one big group, okay, a huge group, with a, some minor variants of it. If you map those out, it turns out that that common haplotype is spread all the way from uh, present-day Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, all the way across through Mongolia into China, and is nowhere else. So what's going on? Well, oddly enough, that's the lands of Genghis Khan, and Genghis Khan was known as being one of the serial rapists of all time. He said his greatest pleasure was to hear the weeping of wives as he slaughtered their men, and his second greatest pleasure was to hear the crying of babies he knew to be his own. And he may have had thousands of children. Um, if he didn't, his sons were just as bad, okay? And the claim is, and it's not a great claim, um, although we'll see uh, in more recent times there may be something that fits, that that map marks the boundary of Genghis Khan's Mongol Empire, and this is Genghis Khan's Y chromosome, okay? Many, many, hundreds of thousands or millions of copies of it. Coming from a time where one man has enormous power and spreads his Y chromosome through huge numbers of nations. Well, that's, that's I think, a bit of a story, but we actually have some better evidence that that can be true. 
um, that when you get social inequality, there are differences in the sexual strategy of males and females, which, as we'll see, are important to our argument. Here we have white genes in black Americans, white mitochondrial types and white Y chromosomes. In, the, in, in New York, twice as many of the European genes in the black population came in through men as through women. In New Orleans, something like seven times as many of the European genes came in through men with their Y chromosomes as through women with their mitochondria. So what that's telling us is what we history hints, that of course the sex between blacks and whites in American history wasn't consensual sex by any means. It was rich slave owners taking advantage of young female slaves. And the figures are really quite striking to have seven times as many genes coming um, one way rather than another. So, um, so you, can, you can disentangle quite a lot about, uh, about human history from the genes. What's this got to do with my question about Adam and Eve? Well, what it suggests, I think, is, first of all, that Adam and Eve did exist. We can certainly trace um, ourselves back to a single male called Adam, as Galton pointed out, through the, y, through the Y chromosomes, as we now know, and a single female called Eve. Um, through the mitochondria. There will have been thousands of other males around and thousands of other females around and the Adam and the Eve were no different at all from the other men and women around at the time, maybe, maybe 100,000 years ago. But the question is, did they meet? Well, that question turns on this difference in the mating strategy of males and females. Now, there is a difference in the mating strategy, at least historically, of men and women. Many people believe that men, on the average, have more sexual partners than women do. Well, they don't, I can tell you. People always say, oh, yes, they do. Well, they don't. Think about it. It takes two to tango. If you're going to dance waltz with somebody, you've got to have a man and a woman, right? So the average has got to be the same. Uh, people, my students could never see this. And I say, imagine that you've got a village of ten couples, okay? And this is a very happy village. There are ten men and ten women, and they're happily married, and they stay married and stay totally faithful throughout their lives. What is the number, average number of mates for, for the men and the women? The answer is one for the men with their wife, one for their uh, women with their husband. Simple, okay? Let's imagine another kind of village, a miserable village, where there are ten men and ten women. Only one man is sexually active, but the other nine are gay, all right? And this one man mates with all the women. What's the average number of matings for the women? It's one each with this one man. What's the average number of matings for the men? It's one again, except it's one man has done it. He's done it ten times, but the average, there are ten men, is one each. So the average is always the same, okay? Um, but there can be big differences in the variance, the variability, as we say. Recently in Britain, and also in the States, there have been attempts to ask people this question. And it's a scientifically interesting question. Of course, it's a medically interesting question, too. How many sexual partners have you had in your lives? Uh, it's been a very disappointing um, exercise. In, me in, in, in Britain, the average 40-year-old man asked in conditions of complete privacy and being told this is a serious piece of medical research, ditto the average 40-year-old woman, the average man says that in his life he's had 9.9 .9 sexual partners. The average woman says 3.4. So somebody's lying, okay? Somebody isn't telling the truth. And so you can't really get these figures out. But what is clear, that there are occasional men out there who do have large numbers of sexual partners. They may, they may do so on a commercial basis rather than a romantic basis, but there is more variability in mating success than in, than in, uh, in men than in women. And that makes comes to the, cr the crux of my argument about whether Adam and Eve ever met. Here's the guy who is in the Guinness Book of Records as the most sexually successful man, in reproductive terms, ever um, recorded. His name was Moulay Ismail the Cruel of Morocco. Um, he lived in the 18th, 17th and 18th centuries. Um, he was a busy man. He said he killed 50,000 Christians with his own sword. He used to make a point of executing his prisoners. Um, but he wasn't too busy to have 888 children. Okay? He lived in this court um, in which effectively all the children was his, were his. So half of those children will have, been, uh, will, have, will have been male and they will have carried his Y chromosome. So who was the who was the Adam of those 444 sons. Clearly, it was Moulay Ismail. 
he was their father, you only have to go back one generation to get back to him. Who was their Eve? Well, it certainly did, she certainly didn't live at the same time as Mulai Ismail, because there was definitely more than one Mrs. Mulai Ismail the Cruel. If you look at the Guinness Book of Records, there is a woman who claims to have had 24 children. I think most people disagree with that. The, the, the medical attested maximum for women is something like 17. Um, but even if women were having 12 children with Mulai Ismail, there would have had to be something like um, 70 or 80 of them in order to allow him to have his 888 children. So to get to the eve of those children in his court, you'd have to go back not to the previous generation, but the generation before and the generation before that. In this diagram at the bottom, we've got today 10, people, 10 boys living, okay? Previous generation, there were 10 men, but only one, two, three of them succeeded in having any children. And that's not unreasonable in historic times. If you look into farming societies, that's often the case. Only a small proportion of men have any children. Under those circumstances, you only have to go back one, two, three, four generations to get to Adam, okay? Uh, the universal, last universal male ancestor. Um, here we have the same village, ten women. But each generation, we allow one, two, three, four, five to reproduce. So half of them. Not a big difference, but there's less variability. And each generation, one, two, three, four, five reproduces, and so on. Some of them die out. And in those circumstances, we have to go back one, two, three, four, five, six, seven generations. So to get it to Eve, we have to go further back into history, simply because of this difference in the variability in mating success by men and women. And if you put the two together, I'd really take you to the take-home message of my talk, which is that whoever Adam uttered that famous English phrase to, Madam, I'm Adam, he didn't say it to Eve. I'll stop it there. Thank you.